Right, what, I, what I'm starting off with really, basically, is very similar to what Alan was saying about order and disorder. Now, to start with, I was, um, I, well, I've been very well most of my life, except for a, I had a liver transplant in 2010, during which time I suffered from encephalitis. And um, you, as you'll probably see, the majority of the paintings, the, the first ones I'm going to show you are the ordered paintings and paintings that I've been uh, basically constructing in a very ordered manner, which is rather similar to what Alan was saying with um, trying to find disorder. But I wasn't trying to find disorder. I was trying to do the reverse. I was trying to make them aesthetically pleasing and make them very compositionally attractive. So these are, this is a large painting that I did from, from the Amazon. And um, it's about eight feet, eight feet by 10. So it's a very large painting. And um, I'll show you now a section of a few pictures that I did before I became ill. And these are from various, this is from 1999. Right, this is another painting that I did from, um, from Ascot. Basically it's called the winner, the, the, the favorite wins at Ascot. And it's, again, it's a very large painting, but the order in it, as you can probably see, you make your own order. It's something that uh, you find your own central axis to, to, uh, to focus on. Oh, hang on, gone, gone. Okay, we'll start there. This is a painting that I did from uh, from Africa, and it's called the Rainbow Nation. All the feathers that surround the tree, which is the central point, actually represent the uh, represent the tribes that make up the South African nation. That's a, that's a painting from South Africa called Stolen to Order, which was basically um, I was living in South Africa at the time, and I. I read in a newspaper that a Picasso had been stolen from, uh, from the Lefebvre Gallery in Cork Street. And um, I thought this would make a rather nice picture. So I decided on all the, my favorite artists to put them all into one painting. The Picasso, I built, I built the lady around the, around the portrait of the Picasso. And you've got the Jackson Pollock in there, you've got Magritte, you've got Arp, you've got Miro, you've got Hockney, and so on. So that's called a stolen to order because these paintings were obviously stolen to order. And he ended up doing a complete sequence of paintings called Stolen to Order from various different parts of the world, South Africa, Argentina, um, Barbados, and so on, so forth. This is, the, this is the first drawings that I started, when I started to get ill, I, I realized that I wanted to do a very large canvas and um, called The Love Letter, which is basically what this talks about. And I started to get ill, and the drawings, as you can probably see from this drawing, started to become a little more uh, I suppose one would call irrational to a certain degree, but uh, probably in Alan's point of view, probably more towards what he was trying to do. But um, I was not. I was not trying to do it uh, logically. I was trying to. It was. This was something that just happened through my illness. And if we can go, if we can go up again. Oh gosh, there we go. That's another drawing. As you can see, they're starting now to become a little bit. Uh, uh, disorientated, well I'm starting to become a little bit disorientated. I had the concept of doing a painting that was about 10 feet by 4 and as I was in hospital I pestered my wife and my daughter to order me a bespoke canvas 10 feet by 4 and I think they, they were a little, uh, a little wary of what my intentions were but I had every intention of producing a painting of this, of this sort of scale and these were the drawing, preliminary drawings that I was doing whilst I was going through the illness this is from 2000. I started becoming ill in 2008. I was actually airlifted from Barbados to, uh, to London. And I spent some time at St. Anthony's Hospital. And then I was in St. George's. And then I was in King's for my transplant. So over the duration of nearly 12, two, two years, from 2008, I had the transplant in 2010. So the draw, these drawings are now representation of that sort of time. And the actual painting that I produced, the love letter, began the actual painting I started in the November, the November of 2009, and I finished after my transplant in February 2010. So it was a four-month transition to do the painting. All the drawings that I'm showing you now will build up to that painting. Now, if I can get this to work. Oh, now this. This is the... If I can get it... To, oh. So there, this seat is the seat that I sat in in Barbados before they hawked me off to hospital. And um, 
you don't want to spend 10 days in uh, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Barbados, <coughs> however ill you are, because you know, it's, um, it's not a very nice place. So eventually, this, but this seat I became, I, I got to know very well before they were giving me the, 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 the uh, okay to fly back home. But it's a very distorted looking drawing. To me it is, to others uh, they, they think it's got some sort of character or characterization. Uh, I suppose when I look back at it now, it, it does have some, there's a familiarity about it that uh, is almost endearing. But uh, that's a personal thing, I suppose. And right, now these, these are the pages that um, Dr. Agrawal had uh, persuaded me to come and talk to you about. Uh, I can't really say much about them, to because to be perfectly honest, they're as confusing to me as they probably are to, to you. Uh, I, at the time, I just assumed they were making complete sense. Uh, I, I can still, to this day, not fathom out really what was going on. But these are all, hang on a second, you've got pages of them here. These were done at St George's Hospital. And these are very similar to the drawing, strangely enough, that Alan was showing you when he was trying to explain... Um, what were you trying to explain? About the dis disorientation? Disorder. 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 You, you, see, did, you just did it because of your illness. Yes, I did, yeah. And the thing is that what, what I was trying to show you earlier were the very ordered paintings and the, very, and the compositions were very direct and ordered in, in a very um, controlled way. Whereas now, with my, with my encephalitis, these were now totally distorting my brain. Although I knew the images that I wanted to produce, this, and this is as near as I could get to, to them. And as you'll see, eventually, they just got stranger and stranger. And even there's some, there's some logical sort of writing in there, but I'm not sure quite uh, I've got here. Kathy, my wife, requests. I have no idea. Assumably, is what I wanted. I've got, I've got, there are obvious things in there, like water. I, I, it, it, they are rather strange to see them large. I, I had actually thought about made, maybe doing some large canvases, having some, I think if I lived in a large apartment, in a, in a loft-like apartment, I'd probably get some of these made up and put them around the walls to, as a memory, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> and this is a, yet another page from the diary. Um, I think uh, the doctors at the hospital, including Dr. Agarwal, um, found them quite fascinating and um, did actually show them to other doctors, asked my permission to show them, which I, which I gave, and um, they, they caused a little bit of a stir, I think, in the, in the, in the unit. Now this one is, it, is starting to go really quite, uh, quite bizarre, uh, but again, when you, see the, when you see what they're leading up to, you may, I don't know whether you're going to be able to assess, now that, that's probably the last one of the pages that I did. I, I've got about two or three sketchbooks full of pages like this. Now I seem to realise, and I knew what I wanted. I knew the images that I was trying to trying to produce, but from this, they bear no relation to the to the final things. And I think that we've shown that one before. Now this is the first logical drawing. This is dated the 17th of December, 2009. So now I'm starting to get some sort of stability or I felt as though I was. This was the painting that was designed for the 10 feet by four feet canvas. And I decided that I also, from the previous drawings, decided that I wanted to do it in black and white, rather like Picasso did with Guernica. It had, a, a, to me, it was my Guernica. It was something that I wanted to produce as a, as a, as a statement as to my illness. But at the time, I was not really aware of why or how or what really was functioning in my brain at all. Now this is a picture of the final piece, which as I say is 10 foot by four foot canvas. And um, eventually what I did, as a, this as I say took four months. So it ranges from, from uh, November, December, January, February. So there are basically four sections of this picture. And it wasn't until I finished it that I realized and I sat back in the studio when I was actually starting to recuperate and become better, 
that I started to look at it and look at it and look at it, and I realized that, in fact, it fell into four categories. If you split the canvas visually into four plate, into four panels, each, with, each one contains a bird. And I, that was a, a subconscious thing that I'd worked on that I didn't really even think about at the time. So what I did, I cut the four pictures. That's a detail from one of the panels. I cut the four pictures, the picture into four, into four panels. That one, two, hang on, I'm going too fast. That's the first panel. So that will, repre that will represent November. The second panel, December. The third panel, January. And then February. So I'm sure to have the whole, th I should have the complete image here. Transplant was, these are drawing, also drawings that I did afterwards for a new painting that I was going to do when I returned to Barbados after I was well. If I can go back to the original, if I can, just so, so you can see the four together, the four panels together. Am I going too fast for you to see? No. No? I can't get this image back now. Oh, here we go. There. That is it all together. So now you can see where the four sections would probably happen. So that there's a bird in each, each one of them. And I'm happy to say that that painting now, as we speak, is probably mid-ocean on its way to Singapore and its final destination being Brisbane. And it was bought by my doctor who worked on me at the time, Dr. Tony Rahman, who has now set up his own liver unit in Brisbane. So that painting is now going to him 10 years later after my illness. So that's basically the result of that. Okay, I think that's all I really have to say about it, uh, and we'll wait for the uh, questions and answers. Unless you want to ask something else. Oh, Alan's just reminded me. Yes, I've got some. Paintings when you were fully well. Yes, when I was fully well. Yes, he's right. I can show you some now that are. I've forgotten that. <laughs> There's paintings now that um, that I've worked on since. Hang on, that's a drawing that I did for. Oh, these are paint. These are drawings. This is a drawing that I did um, when I was uh, when I'd had morphine, and <laughs> so you can see this is self-portrait there, and uh, quite a lot of various images again relating back to the love letter. So they have now becoming more organised again. This is after afterwards. This is in the. The, the smaller drawings that I did with the morphine were obviously in hospital. These are bigger drawings that I did from those sketches. And there's another one here, which is uh, probably even stranger still when I look back on it now. But uh, that's what morphine does to you. And that's, then this is, I was starting to work on oils when I, when I was starting to get better and better. And these are, these are paintings that was from Indonesia. So I was able to travel again, which was good. And uh, now the latest paint, then, as you can see, the organisation is starting to reappear after the disorganisation. You probably don't see that so much in that, but that, uh, that was at while I went to, uh, I went to Mallorca to, to basically get better, and uh, that was after a visit to Miro's studio. So um, this is a painting, a large painting, again, six feet by four. But it's starting now become a little more organized. Now, this was a painting that I did that is completely organized, and it's actually called I Didn't Pay the Ferryman. So it's a reference to the fact that I lived. And this is a painting of the River Stour where I was brought up as a child, and we used to go on boating. So it's a memory. So I was, I'm back, to, I think, back, probably back to normal now. And as you can see, I was doing, I wasn't allowed to travel for a while, so I was doing paintings of England. This was a, a garden party in a, in a place called Little Thacombe, where I had my 40th birthday many, many years ago. This is a painting that I, when I first was allowed to travel again from Indonesia, from a, a voyage that I was allowed to take. And then I've just got, and that is a very large, very large painting, which is eight feet by eight feet of, um, of Papua New Guinea. And I actually crossed that bridge. 
So uh, it is rickety as it looks, I assure you. And uh, so I'm obviously a, far, a, far, a lot better now because I wouldn't have dared to cross that bridge and <laughs> beforehand. Uh, and these are, this, is, this is one of the latest paintings that I'm about to exhibit now, and that is from Chile. So uh, again, the organization has completely returned. And that's all I have to say, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your brilliant work and also sharing your personal story and journey. So thank you. Thank you. Right, we can open up to any questions you might have now. Just wait for the mic. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, both, thank you very much. Both were absolutely fascinating in their, in their very different ways. I, I wanted to ask Alan about Alzheimer art, if you like. If there's any more known, you've shown this very interesting artist. And of course, we remember de Kooning's work at the Expressionism exhibition, in which he deteriorated into beautiful, mm. filmy, and completely disorganized markings on the... I don't know, I don't know of other people, artists, professional artists, who have developed Alzheimer's, and there must be, obviously, an increasing number as we're all getting older, including artists, and more and more developing Alzheimer's. Mm. I, I feel that's a very interesting alternative way of looking at how mm. art is disintegrating mm. an artist. Do you have any comments? I think it's a rare category. But, I mean, the literature, there's so much literature on what's called psychotic art, abnormal psychology in art, outsider art, um, and so many, there is almost as many different types of um, abnormal psychology art as there are abnormalities. And mostly the, the psychotic artists, lots of um, Adolf Wolfley's famous one, Louis Wayne and his cats is famous ones. So I think usually the most exotic ones that get into the literature, but as far as practicing professional artists are concerned, I don't know of many who've gone through this. That's why I'm so fascinated with Andrew's. Andrew's, that should be in the books, really, because it's so obvious of, of a highly skilled artist who undergoes this condition, an identifiable condition, which has been identified medically, and then comes back out of it, the health again, back to that kind of quality of what has extraordinary journey. And in de Kooning's case, he didn't come back out of it. He just, he just developed and developed. I, he couldn't be cured, obviously. But um, I think as far as Alzheimer's is concerned, it's a rare case. The only one I've found has been um, the German artist that I've shown. But yes, de Kooning is a great example. I should have added de Kooning image in there. Yeah. Jacob? Oh. Um, sorry. Okay, Wait, have a cue jumped. <laughs> And thank you for really, really interesting talks. Um, I've just, I'm halfway through a biography of Augustus John, um, who um, I, I presume you know his work, but if you know his story, he was a very middle of the road artist who dived off a cliff and got a catastrophic brain injury and turned into this incredible person who fathered a hundred children and traveled with gypsies and uh, got into fights in World War I. Um, and his description is of him losing his critical voice and having a frontal brain injury which stopped him self-criticizing. And I wonder if you've got any comments about the concept of critical voice um, and how we've all got a voice. Self-criticism. Yes. We've all got a voice that says you can't do it, which stops us doing what you're doing. And Augustus John managed to lose yeah. his frontal lobe and his critical voice. I think you, you con constantly, constantly criticize yourself. Because basically, an artist you work, as an artist, you work alone. So you have no other outside influence. And it's only... Uh, so self-criticism is a very, very important factor. Because you get very little other than once you exhibit or, or from friends or whatever. But self-criticism is a very important factor. And, and it, it, sometimes you can dis end up destroying something completely because, of, because you've been too critical. But sometimes that, that that's that you can't you can't then go back. It's it's a very it's a very awkward situation because you have to make a decision as to whether to actually keep something or not keep it. 
So if you're painting, particularly painting in oils or something, you paint over it. But if you're painting in another medium, it's not so easy. So do you think when you were in the throes of that encephalopathy, yes. you had no self-monitoring and that's, that's uh, art without your, any self -criticism? The weird thing is, at the time, I felt fully in control and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. But the, the, the transition of here to the paper, it wasn't working. So that's why I was ending up with these sort of scribbles. Thank you for two fascinating talks. Um, my question was to Mr. Hukin. Yes. Um, to my eyes, and they're, they're medical eyes, obviously, and I see the world through them now, uh, the, thing, the, 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 the things you did, which I think you said looked like art to you when you were unwell yes. on the ward, looked like medical notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, I, and I, they really, really do. They really do. They look like medical notes. In, in, the, in the top right-hand corner, yes, there is scribbles, yes. but the rest of it looks yeah. like it could be just Maybe pulled from the, the notes. <laughs> no, yeah, and what, I, and what I would like to ask, well, my question... Well, what prescriptions look like? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, my... The strange thing is, I think it was, um, it was Van Gogh, uh, one of the highest ever paid painting, paid expensive paintings, was a portrait of his psychiatrist, which was $43 million. Mm. So... so I guess my, my question, <laughs> sorry, it was... Uh, <laughs> Do you think there's still a trace of your interaction with doctors? So not your autoimmune encephalitis, sorry, your encephalitis, but your interaction with doctors in your art that remains? Well, strangely enough, um, there's about four of the doctors, that, um, including Dr. Aguil, that, uh, that I've got to know have all bought my work. That's <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yes, he says they don't buy his. <laughs> <laughs> don't, the, the, the irony is that he's, they should be buying his, not mine. <laughs> Thank you. Nearest, did you have a question? Yes. Can, can I ask? Yes. Um, uh, it's a bit fascinating. Can I ask? Uh, it's yeah. fascinating to see uh, those images during the time when you had encephalopathy. Yes. I remember looking at it bedside. Um, and you were very keen, as you said, to have that big canvas yes. to paint. Do you think, looking back now and recalling your experience, yes. um, do you think that is a useful thing to do? Or do you think, and, and I would like to know, do you, do you have any recollection of what went through your mind? Uh, and whether that was something distressing for you, not being able to produce it? Or was no. it therapeutic? No, well, to answer, answer your last question first, um, no, I didn't find it distressing at all. In fact, actually, uh, it was a very overpowering and empowering uh, process. And when I'd finished it, or when I, when I assumed I'd finished it, sat back and dissected it, it, it became even more powerful. And uh, it shocked me that the fact that there, were four, there was a bird in each panel. Mm. And I had not even realised that before I actually dissected it. And it was only when they, each one was framed that I saw that. And I actually, I look back on that now as a very, very important piece of work, an extremely important piece of work, because it, it highlighted a, a, a situation that I, that I encompassed and I, 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 I lived through, uh, and it became a very important part of my life. I think it's a, I, I'm, I'm glad that I went through that transition because I can now refer back to that with other drawings that I'm doing uh, for myself that seem to have some sort of correlation with that, with that picture. So I'm still doing drawings very similar to that, but I've not shown them to anyone. It sounds as if in retrospect you're finding it interesting to look back at your work. I wonder about the actual process itself whilst kind of there and doing the work, was that always, therapeutic? I think as an artist you always look back in retrospect. Yeah. You, you, you tend to, I mean, I recently produced a book of work of 50 years of my work, mm. and it wasn't until the book was completed that I, uh, that I flipped through it. And my immediate thought is, firstly, of how much body of work I have, because I, I work quite quickly, mm. even though that picture took four months. That was due to my illness. And, and a lot of deep thought went into it. But um, no, I think it's very important to, to look back. And, and, yeah. and in retrospect, it, it, it makes you a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can become very critical, very self-critical. Yeah. But most of the criticism, for me personally, happens 
in the studio when I'm mm. when I'm doing the work, not afterwards. Okay. A lot of artists are more critical once their work is finished. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, loads of questions. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got a microphone. Oh, brilliant! Thanks. Um, just a quick question on. Um, you must have gone through ups and downs in your life. I mean, did you experience a similar amount of same extent of problems? When you were low in your lives, and uh, as as you had a phase when, um, uh, to you low. specifically, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> yeah. um, when you had the encephalitis, I mean, what, was yes. it any different to the experience that you had as an artist? Um, um, only the obvious ones of uh, poverty and uh, striking out to try and make a living. I mean, I, fortunately, since I left the Royal College in 1973, I've actually managed to make a living as as a, as a painter, which is difficult these days. So, I, I mean, any difficulties have been basically financial, mm -hmm. but I've always managed to sort of scrape through because I've always felt that what I'm doing is important. And if I think if you feel, if you believe in yourself and you feel important that what you're doing is important, somehow you, you manage it. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I was just uh, curious about knowing the, the, the um, um, I was just um, going um, I, I just been to the Van Gogh um, oh, exhibit. Right. It's interesting to note that the best piece of sunflowers he did was when he was going through a tough time in his life, just a few years before he killed himself. Yeah. So the the contrast was that here he was producing the well, best maybe, of the maybe art. Maybe my better work is to come. So <laughs> <I'm coming laughs> <time. laughs> okay, we've got a couple yeah. more questions over here. I'll let you know. <laughs> Uh, Andrew, uh, I'm a liaison psychiatrist are, in sorry, uh, Melbourne, and my oh, unit. sorry, I can't see. My unit. Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. My unit covers the liver transplant unit. Yes. Uh, so that's my connection with you, and oh, often right. we are, uh, we become the reference point for patients when they're encephalopathic because they've got to know us during the illness, and yes. uh, we become often the, the orientation point. Uh, what I wanted to, to ask you was something I, I had, a, independently of that, I, one of my patients uh, uh, was one of Australia's famous artists. I, I won't say any more. I know who you mean. Uh, <laughs> yes. The, uh, and he... Uh, Is he a like academician? He, he suffered from existential depression, yeah. basically, and his paintings never reflected that. Yeah. But when I met him, because he was depressed, he had difficulty actually painting. Uh, and we struggled with that, and he eventually got to do some paintings. Yes. And he used to send me a Christmas card every year, which he had painted himself. It was a major effort for him. Yeah. And in the end, the, the last one he sent me was a purchase card. He, couldn't, he was no longer able to actually motivate himself. Yes. Do, do you have any comment on the sort of motivation in patients who are depressed? Um, I, th I think, basically, as a, the, the, way, the way the one constructs thoughts as a painter is that if something happens to you like that your 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 real sense of communication is through your through your work and you do that through to yourself i think that's that's really where the strong drawing and the the elements of wanting to do something come through and it's very difficult to for other people just sometimes to to assess that in an aesthetic way because it's something it's rather like writing yourself a list of what you want to do or what you want to be or, or, or objectives, but you do it through drawing. Am I, am I answering what you asked? Yes, you. yes, I think I know the person you're talking about as well. Great. All right, I think we've got one more question there. Yep. Hello, just for clarity, so if an artist is more into type of disorganized art, uh, when they're unwell, it, does it become more organized and then so is it the change in the type of art or is the quality of art? I'm not really sure what you're asking me. So if, if you are well, for example, art, a well uh, artist, uh, more into this, this organized type of art, if they're unwell, does it become more organized and then when they recover it's more disorganized or...? Uh, so, so it, it, this fluctuation, when because the dip of art, does it come more yeah, organized? Uh, so it, does it depend the change of uh, 
the type of art or the quality of art? It, it, it's very difficult for me to answer that question because at the time I felt totally organized, although I was disorganized. Mm. And as far as I was concerned, I was, I was doing something completely organized. It's only, it's only looking back at it now, it looked totally disorganized. At the time, I thought it was completely... Mm. I knew what I was doing. Nobody else knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing. So all, all those drawings that I showed you that looked like scribbles, I assumed at the time that I knew what they were. Okay. Does that... I, I mean, think this I, is I, a conversation for, for it's later a very in the break. Confusing, <laughs> it's a very confusing thing yeah. to talk about because it's something that hopefully comes through with the work. Then yeah. your perceptions yes. are yeah. All right, I'd just like to say thank you again to both of our speakers. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.